Hey everyone, it's Colin, how's it going? I've got an old Pentium 2 series ThinkPad running Windows Me, but I can't help but wonder, would it be possible to get this thing upgraded to Windows 10? You may remember this machine from a previous episode. This is my IBM ThinkPad 390E, 300 megahertz, 160 mega RAM, hard drive we'll talk about in a moment, but the previous episode was about swapping out the hard drive in this thing for a compact flash card and installing Windows Me on it. Now, the 300 megahertz is in the form of a Celeron processor. You may be like, wait a minute, the title is about Pentium 2. Well, this is a Pentium 2 class Celeron CPU. In fact, in that era, there were very few differences between the Pentium and the Celeron CPUs. In some cases, the Celerons were actually the better deal because you could overclock them and get better performance at a lower cost than the equivalent Pentium CPU. So anyway, I'm calling this a Pentium 2 class machine. It is a Celeron, but there's not that big of a difference in terms of performance. Anyway, this machine, and I'm gonna get it powered on and we'll talk about what we're gonna do here. I've already swapped the hard drive in this thing. I was using a smaller couple gigabyte compact flash card before. For trying to get Windows 10 installed on this, there's absolutely no way that that's gonna be enough storage. So I went on eBay, I picked up a 30 gig IDE hard drive. I've already got it installed in the back of the machine. And also to save time, I've pre-installed Windows XP on this laptop. It takes forever. The machine only has a CD drive, so that's gonna be a limiting factor, which we'll talk about in a moment. It took like over an hour to get XP installed on here. It's fascinating how big of a difference in speed just for installing the OS, newer OSs have over these older ones. It's, it's hilarious. Another thing you may notice is that I've got an external mouse hooked up. That's because annoyingly enough, the internal track point on this machine, I'll see, of course, now it works. When I was installing XP on this machine last night, and I actually tweeted about it if you follow me, um, last night this track point just didn't want to work to save its life. Like I would move it around, absolutely nothing would happen. I have no idea why that was the case yesterday. And I even tried power cycling and rebooting the machine a bunch of times. And yet today, this is the first time I've powered this machine on today. Yeah, it works just fine. So, okay, whatever. Anyway, the goal of course is to try and get Windows 10 running on this. Now let's talk about how we're gonna do that and some of the rules for trying to make that happen. The first thing is, I want to work incrementally up to Windows 10. I'm, to be honest, I'm not 100% certain I can get it working on this machine. So I want to try and go to Windows 7 first, and then from 7 we can decide where we want to go. The other thing is, let's talk about the rules a little bit. I don't want to invest a whole ton of hardware into these systems to try and get them to run Windows 10. I think part of the fun is to get them to run on a machine as close to stock as possible. Now, I know 160 mega RAM like this machine has nowhere near. It's just not going to cut it. So I'm saying that RAM upgrades are going to be OK for the purposes of trying to make this work. But I don't want to throw a ton more hardware at this thing. One of the major limits to trying to get this mod to work, this upgrade, is going to be the optical drive. Like I said, it's only a CD-ROM. You can't really install Windows 10 off of a CD-ROM. The media is a DVD-sized file. Like if you were to download the ISO file, it's four point something gigabytes. You can't load that off of a CD, at least not easily. But I've got a plan which we'll take a look at. Minimal upgrades to the hardware in terms of rules. The other thing is I really, really want the hardware to install the OS itself. I, I realized that I could just take the drive out, plug it into a modern computer, install Windows 10 onto that drive and then stick it in here. But again, that's no fun. Um, I want there to be some kind of challenge. I want to see just how far we can go with an old machine like this in terms of operating system. If you were to try and upgrade it and this is the only computer that you really had access to. Get the idea? I'm, I'm trying to make it fun, okay? So, so the idea is I've got a partition for Windows XP and then I've got a small partition that's just gonna be for storing files. 
So here's what I mean by that. I've got this second partition and what I did was I hooked up a USB flash drive, which took forever to copy all the files from the standard Windows 7 installer over to here. So the idea is because I don't have a DVD drive, I can't boot off of a DVD to get all this stuff installed, but it should work just as well installing off of a second partition. And so the idea will be to install Windows 7 on top of Windows XP. Let's see how far we can go here. So I'm gonna run just the regular setup program and we'll do an install now. And of course an error. And the error is we need to have a minimum of 512 mega RAM. So like I was saying, I think RAM upgrades are definitely gonna happen. It detects the 160 that's in there, so it can't proceed. Let me turn this thing off and I'll show you what we're gonna do. So I anticipated that I wouldn't have enough RAM <laughs> like any <laughs> proper YouTuber would. Um, so I went and bought some ahead of time because I just figured, yeah. I'm really surprised. So these are a pair of 256 meg modules. They are PC 100. It's a matched pair. It's good quality RAM. It's made by Samsung. These cost me all of seven bucks. Now they were purchased off of eBay and there's a few sellers that do this. They're all based in China and they advertise this RAM as being brand new. Now, this may be good quality RAM and seven bucks for old RAM like this shipped from China, I think is a really good deal, but there is absolutely no way that this RAM is brand new. I don't think they've made PC100 RAM in years. So just something to keep in mind, though, hey, if you need RAM for old systems, it's hard to beat seven bucks. Anyway, so a pair of 256s is a total of 512. Let me flip this machine over, swap it out, we'll power it on, make sure that it sees it all, and then try it again. All right, and let's check, make sure all the RAM is there. Yeah, cool, 512 meg, awesome. Let's make this happen. All right, try it again. Set up that exe. Well, no, no warning about not having enough RAM, so that's that's a good sign. Um, no, I don't want the latest updates because that's just going to take way more time. I accept all your whatever. I'm going to do a custom install. Yeah, and that's fine. I want this to be a clean Windows 7 install instead of doing some weird upgrade thing. It's basically just going to kind of archive the old version of Windows XP in case you want to roll back to it at some point, I guess. But yeah, I guess now we just wait because it's got to copy files for a while. Okay, so it's rebooted and we're starting up. I think it's going to finish the install and then we should be good to go with Windows 7. That's interesting, yeah, the starting window. So this machine, it's got an 800 by 600 screen. And I think this phase of setup wants 1024 by 768. I don't think that matters, but it is kind of funny that it's all kind of pushed off. So there's this section here and I should be seeing more below it, but I'm sure we'll get there in time. So I've let this sit here for about 20 minutes now and it's still stuck. There's no hard drive activity. The fan in the computer isn't really spinning. I kind of think it's frozen. Um, this may not be as easy as we think it is. So I'm gonna power cycle the machine. We'll see if maybe, maybe a second attempt will get it going. So yeah, this thing's definitely stuck. No hard drive activity. It just stays at this screen. The fact I don't have a progress bar is frustrating, but I don't think it really matters. I suspect there's something about this setup that's having problems on this hardware. So I'm gonna come up with another option and we'll see if maybe plan B will at least get Windows 7 up and running on this old ThinkPad. I'm gonna try one more thing, but to be honest, I'm not holding out a whole ton of hope. I've got a CD here that I burned of Windows 7 PE. It's a CD, so it should be bootable, at least in this drive, it's not a DVD. Let me get this thing fired up and we'll talk about exactly what Windows 7 PE is and then why I don't think this machine is really gonna get any farther than where we have been so far. Okay, so yeah, I do wanna boot off the CD. 
Windows PE stands for pre-installation environment. And it's actually the thing that boots off of like the installs, DVDs, or if you ever make your own Windows installable USB flash drive, you know, like one of these guys um, to install, you know, a more modern version of Windows. PE is this really, really small, lightweight version of Windows specifically designed for installing Windows. The idea is it's not the full desktop experience. Usually at most you get a command prompt or just the single setup program that you normally see that takes the full screen when you boot off of a you know bootable DVD or a bootable USB flash drive. The idea with PE though is it's really lightweight. The whole thing is only a couple hundred megabytes. And what's really interesting about PE is that it actually boots from RAM. Meaning when you start up Windows PE, it actually loads from your boot media and writes into the computer's memory and then runs from there. So conceivably, once you've booted into Windows PE, you can take the CD or the DVD or the USB flash drive out of the computer and it'll just keep up and running, right? It's running out of a, effectively a RAM disk. It's supposed to be really, really lightweight and not have much in terms of system requirements. I was thinking that doing the Windows 7 upgrade from XP approach would be probably the quickest and simplest way to get 7 installed on this old hardware. I figured it would just override all the files, the computer would reboot, it'd do just do a little bit quick more work and then we'd be done. Apparently it's a little bit more complicated than that and when it reboots that first time where we were getting hung up before, was it actually booting into Windows PE? Apparently it, it copies Windows PE to the computer's hard drive as well. So as part of the upgrade, it boots into PE and then it does more of the upgrading, moving files around kind of step. If I can get this to work, I've got an ace up my sleeve as to how to get Windows 7 installed onto the hard drive of this computer. But see the CD's already spinning down, the activity light isn't doing anything anymore. I don't know if it's specifically this hardware. I don't know if there's something, see, and this is all the more we'll get. This is where you'd start to see in Windows 7 where you'd start to see like the four colors of the Windows logo coming together. This is where we got hung up with last time. I don't know if it's like this computer, if there's something maybe with the motherboard. It is running the latest BIOS. I don't know if it's a graphics thing. Maybe it's a RAM thing. I kind of doubt it. 512 is, doesn't sound like a lot, but I think it is. Maybe it's a CPU thing, I'm not sure. It might be a mistake to be doing this on a laptop. I don't have any really old desktops. I don't have the space for them. I think laptops, older laptops are more fun anyway. But I think what we're having is a Windows PE problem. I'm gonna keep working on this one a while longer off camera and see if I can at least get it to a Windows PE command prompt. But I'm gonna be honest with you, I wouldn't be surprised if I can't do it. And it kind of sucks to be admitting defeat this relatively early on. I'm going to give this one more shot off camera and we'll see where we can get with it. So it's a decent amount of time later and you can tell I have a different laptop on my desk. I don't know why that ThinkPad didn't want to do it. If you've got any information about the older Pentium 2 series machines not wanting to boot Windows PE, I would love to hear it. I tried for a few more hours after that last shot. I tried different Windows disks. I even spun up an, another custom Windows Vista PE disk, built one of those, tried it. It got stuck at the same place, just didn't want to work. And I don't know why. Again, you got any ideas, let me know. I want to see if I can at least get Windows 7 on that old ThinkPad. But I want to move forward with the challenge. So we're going one generation ahead. This is a Dell Latitude C610. This is a Pentium 3 machine. I believe this one is one gigahertz. Giga RAM, 20 gig IDE hard drive, 1024 by 768 LCD panel on this one, which is nice. Again, CD drive, not a DVD drive. So it still kind of adds to the challenge. Um, still only has like one USB port on the thing. It's definitely an old school laptop. As a side note, I was actually really, really happy to find this machine. I went to a place here in the Minneapolis area called Free Geek. Um, it's a nonprofit. Their main goal is to get computers to people who need them. You know, if you're underprivileged or 
otherwise need technology but can't afford it. They take donations of older computers, but not like super old. And they rehab it and get it so you can have a computer and get on the internet and all that. Anyway, they occasionally get really old machines that they just can't turn around and give to people. Like they just, this is too old of a machine to give to somebody to use on the modern internet. They had this. And this model actually means a lot to me because I had one of these way back in college when I was working for the campus IT department. They gave me one of these for a while to use. And it's a really, really nice machine. This particular unit is almost flawless. Like it's got very, very little signs of wear on it. So I'm super happy to have it. This thing cost me all of 50 bucks. And considering that's for like nonprofit, that's kind of for charity and it's not just some guy, you know, going and blowing it on whatever. I'm okay with having spent 50 bucks on an old computer like this, but I suspect it's quite possible this being a Pentium 3 may be the ticket to getting us at least closer, if not to the goal of running Windows 10. I've already got Windows 7 installed on here just to save some time, because again, that just takes forever. I'm gonna try and do a similar thing to this machine that we did with the ThinkPad though, and I wanna move it kind of incrementally up until we can get to Windows 10. So the next OS, that we're gonna run on this thing is gonna be Windows 8. Now I'm gonna do this, I think, in a little bit different way because I know this can boot Windows PE. I'm not necessarily gonna try and do the upgrade from within the OS bit. I'm gonna just make sure that I've got all the files that I need on this computer's drive, and then we'll boot it from another Windows PE disk, you know, like the one that I burned. And then I'll show you the alternate method that I was gonna use on the ThinkPad to get the OS installed on the hard drive. Well, that's not good. Did you see that? So it just crashed and burned horribly. Threw a whole bunch of error codes and said, your computer needs to restart. I don't think that's a very good sign. Okay, so I spent some time last night doing some research and I think I've got a plan. I'm hoping this is gonna work. There's some good promise to it. I found this website called mydigitallife.net. They've got forums with a lot of people who are pretty experienced with apparently doing this kind of stuff. I found this gigantic thread basically about people who wanna run Windows 8 on machines that are older and I learned quite a bit by poking through that thread and I found some steps that I'm hoping are gonna get us at least to getting Windows 8 installed on this Latitude C610. So Windows 8 requires generally three things of the CPU in order for it to work. A thing called PAE, SSE2, and then NX or XD, depending on you know which CPU you have and how they label it. PAE allows you to put basically more RAM in the computer than otherwise a 32-bit OS would allow you to do, so the CPU helps with that. So Windows 8 requires you to have that support in your CPU, plus SSE2, which are some additional instructions on XD or NX, uh, which is execute disable, and it's a security thing. Uh, it ties into DEP in Windows. Now, NX apparently is kind of an optional thing that you need to have, but there's uh, there are still some checks in Windows to see if, if that's there along with those other two attributes. And I found some really interesting tools that the, um, the community at, at My Digital Life kind of pulled together along with some good instructions about how you can kind of bypass all those checks when trying to install Windows 8. So I'm gonna try those steps now. Uh, the first thing I need to do is get into disk part and we need to format the C drive on this machine because I'm going to basically be wiping it and loading Windows 8 on top of it. Um, so we start with list disk. There's only one disk. Uh, list partition. Oh, excuse me. Okay, so there's the two partitions. The first 12 gig one, that's the C drive. The second one here is the one that I've got all those files and everything copied over to. Um, so we can also do a list volume and that'll show what letter everything is. So the CD-ROM is E, C, and then D. So we need to do 
uh, volume one uh, fs equals ntfs quick. We need to make that the active partition, okay. And we'll just assign it back letter C again. So we can go over to E, which is the CD-ROM. And in here, it's pretty much the standard stuff for uh, Windows 7 PE disk. I, I went out and I built this in a virtual machine. It took a little while, you have to download some tools from Microsoft, but it's actually free. You don't have to pay anything to get any of the tools to build a Windows PE disk. And it fits on a CD. And I copied over a couple of things. I copied over this utility, this W8 CPU feature patch. And then I also copied over this tool called ImageX. So this feature patch, that's one of those programs that I found in that forum thread that should help us get where we want to go. ImageX is a Microsoft tool and that's used to actually write images to the computer's hard drive. So it's part of the way that Windows now gets deployed to computers. Let me kick this off and then we'll talk a little bit about how you actually install Windows now versus the older OS's. Install.wim is the file that I need to lay down to the C drive. Image X, apply, and then in this case it's going to be D install.wim1, and we'll talk about this in a second, and then C colon backslash. And then that should start writing it out. So in older versions of Windows, we would see it get installed to the hard drive through kind of a DOS environment on a file by file basis. If you've ever watched like Windows XP or Windows 2000 or even older OSs, Windows Me 98, whatever, you'll know that it, it goes through a whole bunch of file copies, right? It just, it dumps a whole bunch of individual files from the installed disk or floppies to the computer's hard drive. Newer versions of Windows, starting with Vista, they boot into Windows PE, and then they use these things called WIMS, Windows Image Files. And it's a major, major change to the way that Windows actually gets installed. So instead of it being a file by file thing, where the setup program figures out which individual file needs to be on your computer based on the computer type and the options that you select. Instead, Microsoft offered Windows really as just a single image. And it's a lot faster. It's a lot simpler because everything's all just packed together. And then when the computer boots for the first time, it figures out what it needs to use and what it doesn't. What's cool about that is you can have multiple versions of an OS within a Windows image. So in this case, I had to specify this one parameter after specifying which file I wanted because I need to pick which specific version of Windows is in that image. Okay, and just like that, we're all done. That actually didn't take too long, 15 minutes or so to copy that image down. So the next step that we wanna do is where we get to hacking Windows just a little bit with some of these utilities. Um, so let's go back into the E drive. And you can see I have this W8 CPU feature patch thing. Um, so let's fire that up. So this is a utility that somebody wrote. I don't know exactly who, um, but the idea is it edits some of the Windows files to tweak it, to do basically what we want it to do. Uh, some of these are gonna to apply to us, some of these are not going to apply to us. So in this case, I'm gonna uncheck backup original file because I kind of have nothing to lose. First thing I want to do is remove the PAE check because we definitely don't need that. And it's looking for this program called winload.exe. So we're going to go into the C drive of my newly installed volume and that's in Windows System32. Okay, so there's the winload.exe. Do that. Uh, do I have to do something first? Try it again. No. Oh, I wonder, hang on. I think I need to do what they call take ownership of that file. Starting with, oh, I don't remember if it was Vista or Windows 7, uh, Microsoft started adding special protections to those kind of critical Windows files so that even you, if you're an admin user, can't really get in and screw with them. Um, part of it's to protect the OS from getting corrupted, but the other part is to protect it from a security perspective so people can't just replace those files with hacked versions, kind of like what I'm trying to do here. So I need to tweak it so that I can actually be able to modify that file, basically defeat its own protection here. Okay, so that's been modified. Let's go back into 
Let's try this one. I know that's the other thing I have to do in NTOS kernel. Alright, NTOS kernel. This is actually the kernel for the OS, and we're packing it up. Okay, so that works. Alright, the next steps that we have to do is actually make the drive bootable. Just because we copy the files over to it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to work. And then that should write some of the boot code. Yep, okay, cool. And then we also need to write a boot sector. And it'll write that. Yep, okay. Let's uh, let's give this a shot and see where we get. Cross fingers. Okay, Windows 8 logo. Ow! Oh. Uh, because the digital signature of a file couldn't be verified. Hang on, hang on. We got an option here, F8. Okay, and what we want is to turn is to do seven. Disable driver signature enforcement. All right, we're moving along here. I really hope this works. So it's a while later yet again. Um, this thing is just stuck. I can't get it past going to the blank screen. We should be going through the setup right now. It should be asking me, you know, do you want to set up a local account? What password do you want to use? All that kind of stuff. It can't get that far. So there's obviously some problems with it booting. I also kind of broke the rules and I even took the hard drive out of this machine, hooked it up to an IDE to USB adapter and plugged it into another computer and modified the files that way. And still, no matter what I do, I just can't get Windows 8 to want to boot all the way on this machine. I hate to say it, but I kind of got to call it for this one. I think those CPU extensions that Windows 8 wants actually are really important. And I did find some anecdotal notes in that forum thread about people saying, you know what, you can probably get away with doing that SSE2 and XD patch. But a lot of them said, the CPU really needs to support PAE in order for Windows 8 to work correctly. I mean, they wrote the patch capability in there, but a lot of people saying that they just didn't have very good results trying to get it to work on a CPU that doesn't do PAE. I'm just gonna say kind of overall, if you've got a Pentium 3, Windows 7, no problem. Windows 8, not so much. So we need to move on, see what else we can find to get Windows 8, if not Windows 10, up and running. Perhaps something like this. This is a ThinkPad R51. This is a Pentium M Celeron M series system. Uh, let's get it fired up. It's a Celeron M 1.3 gig. So this is two generations newer than that Latitude. What's nice about this computer is it has a DVD drive and it can boot from USB. I paid all of 30 bucks for it. So yeah, send help. I need to stop buying old old computers, especially old laptops, but 30 bucks, hard to complain. Um, this machine is actually really nice. It does show some wear. This was kind of a Road Warriors computer. There's an asset tag on the bottom. I'm not gonna show that. I have to take it off still from the company that used to own it before this thing went off to the recycling company that I got it from. You know, you can tell this thing's had some wear. The real bummer is while it's overall in really good shape and there's nothing broken, it smells a little bit. I cleaned up the outside as best I could, but you can tell this thing has spent some nights in smoky hotel rooms because um, when the CPU fan ramps up, it kind of smells like cigarettes, which is... That sucks. Strangely enough, even though it was used for a business, it's actually got a copy of XP Home on it. And that's actually what the sticker on the bottom of the machine, the certificate of authenticity with the product code, that's what that's for. But as nice of hardware as this is, it's still somewhat limited. Like I'm getting this pop-up about can't connect to a preferred wireless network. This thing has a built-in wireless card, but it doesn't support WPA2, which kind of stinks. Um, so you can't really connect to most modern Wi-Fi, and I'm not really willing to dump my router down to WPA or WEP so this thing can connect. I mean, the security implications are kind of bad. 1.3 gig Celeron M, 2 gig of RAM, um, XP Home Service Pack 3. I don't think the graphics are gonna, you know, blow anybody away. Yeah, it's just the Intel integrated graphics. So uh, some lightweight gaming, 
you could probably get away with. Um, I may just rock SimCity 2000 on this thing, well, like every other computer that I that I use. But one thing I did find is in the hard drive, there's actually two partitions. Um, there's the C drive, as you'd expect, but then there's the D drive. The D drive has been exposed. It's about five gig in size. I would expect this to normally be hidden because I think this folder is actually the restore like recovery partition kind of data. Um, there's about a one gig file here and then there's this program called recovery.exe. Off camera, I did make a copy of all these files. Obviously I need to wipe the drive to try and reinstall, you know, Windows 10 on this thing, see if we can get that working. But I'm, I'm gonna keep this because someday, you know, I may wanna revert this thing back to Windows XP and get it to look, you know, all cool with the IBM wallpaper and everything like it's got back in the way it was just, you know, cause why not? So I do have a copy of all those files and who knows, maybe a future episode will feature this machine some more and exploring XP and what this computer was like back when it was new. But for now, I'm gonna get my bootable disc and we're gonna see if we can't get Windows 10. Let's just go for the gold on this one. All right, so I've got my Windows 10 32-bit bootable flash drive. And because this thing can boot from USB, assuming I can figure out where the port is, picked it up right away, SanDisk Ultra, boot from USB. So it's been 15 minutes and we're still stuck here. I haven't even gotten the spinny dots. I was really hoping this machine wouldn't put up a fight, but apparently it wants to as well, which is disappointing. I mean, it's it's periodically ramps up the CPU fan, so it's it's chewing on something, but I have no idea what. And I wish it would just throw an error message or something to give me a clue as to what it's getting hung up on. This. CPU should support everything that a modern version of Windows needs. I mean, this Celeron 1.3 gig should support PAE and SSE2 and execute disable bit. The BIOS on this machine has been updated all the way. All the, you know, the firmware, everything. I see no reason why this shouldn't work, but it doesn't wanna. And that's super, super frustrating. So I guess I gotta go back to doing the kind of hack approach. Oh, here we go, thank you, yeah. So interesting timing there. It's, why is it complaining about PAE? The CPU supports PAE, but all right, we'll try and do it the hard way. We'll boot off of the Windows 7 disk and we'll copy the image over using ImageX and maybe, maybe that'll work. I don't know, we'll find out. Okay, so we got the image laid down on here and I did all the other crap that we got to do to make it bootable. I'm actually curious, let's uh, let's give it a go. I shouldn't have to do this. I mean, we know, I know this CPU is capable of SSE and NX. Let's just see if we can remove the PAE check because that's what the Windows 10 PE was barfing about. Let's see what we get. Holy crap, it worked this time. On Windows 10, no less. All right, here we go. Intentionally tell it to boot off of the hard drive this time around, instead of the CD or the USB. That's not right. <laughs> what was that? Yeah, I want to boot off of the hard drive, please. Well, it seems to want nothing to do with that. That sucks. That really sucks. So after a lot more goofing around off camera, yeah, this thing, it's the same deal. I can't get Windows 8 or Windows 10 to want to boot on this thing correctly. 
because of the lack of PAE. Now, here's the thing that's really frustrating. I did some digging into the CPU in this thing, and this particular CPU actually supports PAE, the Celeron that is in this machine. However, it's a known bug with this generation of CPUs that while Intel put PAE support into the CPU, the CPU won't actually report that it has that capability. And I confirmed this, I mean, I even ran CPU-Z on this thing and it shows it does SSC2 and MMX and all the stuff, but it doesn't report having PAE support. There's a next generation of CPUs that's supposed to be compatible with the motherboard in this ThinkPad that will report correctly that it has PAE. I literally spent weeks working on this project, trying to all the different combinations of stuff. It, it's gone by really quickly for you just because I've edited it down so heavily, but I just, I don't know if I'm willing to throw even more money into this project, right? I'm about a hundred bucks in so far as it is with not a whole lot to show for it, I can confirm that, you know what, a Pentium 3, it's just not gonna do anything newer than Windows 7. Something of this generation, the whole Pentium M, Celeron M, which interestingly enough, as a side note, is actually related more to the Pentium 3 than it is to the Pentium 4. Apparently the Pentium 4 was actually a bit of a dead end in terms of CPU architecture, like they just couldn't get much more out of it. So what's funny is by the time we started getting into the so-called core architecture, um, which is what the Pentium M and the Celeron M kind of started and eventually worked into the Core Duo, Core 2 Duo, and now the Core i series that we're all familiar with, these CPUs are actually based off of the Pentium 3. Interestingly enough, Intel went back and found that the Pentium 3 architecture was actually a lot better at moving forward. They were able to get much more out of it and kind of iterate based on it compared to the Pentium 4. So side note over, I just found that really interesting doing the research to figure out what the deal is with this. For about 30 bucks, I could buy a next generation Pentium M. Um, this Celeron is from what they call the, what is it? The Banius, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, um, family of CPUs. The next generation after that was called Dohan, was the code name for it. And supposedly those CPUs, some of the CPUs in that series report correctly and will work better. But, uh, you know, I'm, I've kind of bent and broken my own rules enough so far. I think I'm just kind of done with it. So sad to say, Windows 8, Windows 10 on even Pentium M, Celeron M machines, these are, I think this machine's maybe 12 years old, 10 years old, somewhere in there. Even that's still not good enough. And it's really interesting to learn that it's not just a matter of how much CPU horsepower do you have, how much RAM you know, do you have, how much hard drive space do you have. There actually have been technology improvements in CPUs that Microsoft is taking advantage of with newer versions of its operating system. You think, you know, Windows is such a minor iterative process and everyone says all oh, the only difference between Windows 8 and Windows 10 is just that they changed the way the UI works. So the same thing between seven and eight, you know, they just made the operating system look differently, but under the hood, it's pretty much the same. And well, that is actually not the case, believe it or not. Uh, they do kernel, you know, level changes, pretty drastic ones by requiring new and additional features in the newer versions of the operating system. So no, you can't go and take a new operating system and put it on the oldest hardware that you can possibly find. So it's a bummer for the purpose of this video, but at least we learned something in the process. Uh, not only did I show you how to kind of sneaky install Windows on a computer that otherwise setup wouldn't let you do it on, but we also learned that one, there's an interesting kind of underground community trying to hack Windows to run on this old hardware. And two, there actually are limitations as to how far back you really can go. The hardware actually does make a difference. So while it may be the end of the road for this thing, Pat, when it comes to this journey of trying to get Windows 10 running on something really old and crappy, that's not the end of this story. I'm not gonna leave you on a failure note, right? So this thing, Pat, is done, but check this out. This is an Asus EPC701. This is like one of the original netbooks. This thing is horrible when it comes to hardware. And I know there are a lot of people who love these machines, but I'm sorry, this thing is kind of horrible. 
This particular laptop shipped with Linux on it. It's a 900 megahertz Celeron CPU, 512 mega RAM, and it's got four gig of built-in flash storage. This particular model doesn't have any expandability in terms of storage, and four gig is not enough to get Windows 10 running, but check it out. I've got Windows 10 running on this netbook natively. And what's really funny is it actually wasn't that hard. Now, I don't have enough storage in this machine to load Windows 10 directly on that flash. And I even took the computer apart and looked inside to see is that flash on like a module that I can replace. Turns out, no, it's not. It's soldered to the motherboard. So I had to come up with another option. And the simple other option was this machine has an SD card slot on the side. And the SD card slot is connected to the USB 2.0 bus. So what I ended up doing was simply sticking a 16 gig SD card in the side and installing Windows to that. This machine does boot off of USB, so I was able to use a USB flash drive with Windows 10 on it in order to boot the machine up and install Windows 10. But the built-in setup that you would normally see with the nice GUI just click next a whole bunch of times to install Windows, it barfed because it doesn't want to install directly to a USB attached disk, which is what it saw that SD card as because the reader's on the USB bus. So what I ended up having to do is dump out into the command line and apply the image using ImageX the exact same way that we tried with these other computers. But I didn't have to do any of the other tweaks. I literally just applied the image and did the BCD program and then built the, you know, the boot sector with the MBR and stuff. And then I rebooted the netbook and it just came right up. Granted, it was ridiculously slow doing that, but it worked which is hilarious. Generally, the UI elements are okay. I've got a 16 gig SD card in here, but when you just double click on anything, it kind of takes forever. And this is relatively fast in terms of just like, you know, double clicking through folders and stuff. But if you ask it to do anything complicated, it's gonna sit and spin for a while. Partially, I think, because it literally only has 512 mega RAM and that's barely enough for Windows to fit in. So it's swapping to the page file a lot but the page file is on the SD card and the SD card is pretty slow because one, it's an SD card and two, it's on a USB 2.0 bus. So it's, it's not doing itself any favors. Now this machine isn't perfect. By no means would I ever actually want to use this computer on a daily basis as is. Part of it's actually because there are some major driver problems going on here. Windows 10 just doesn't have drivers for everything in the system. Here's a good example of how slow it is. We're hula hooping of death like you wouldn't believe. Specifically, the biggest issue with this one is graphics drivers. Intel apparently never wrote modern graphics drivers for this particular chipset for anything newer really than Windows XP. Apparently you can get some of those drivers to work under Vista or Windows 7, but that's because they're in an older mode called XPDM, I think it is, that Vista and Windows 7 still have support for. Apparently they pulled out support for those drivers and only went with the newer WDDM type drivers, starting with Windows 8. So Windows 8, Windows 10, you're kind of stuck. Now, like the built-in just basic generic display adapter works. I mean, obviously I'm seeing stuff on the screen, but one of the weird problems is this screen is such a bizarre resolution. It's actually 800 by 480. And the built-in driver doesn't have support for that. So it's all stretched out horizontally and I just can't do anything about that. So there's some really weird issues and glitches here and there, but otherwise, I mean, it, it's up and running. And what I really kind of can't believe is that it's running off of an SD card that once you lay the image down, the fact that the USB bus on this computer is bootable, it saw the SD card as a valid boot device and it just works. So there you have it, Windows 10 on really underpowered kind of old hardware. I think this machine's about 10 years old. It's not exactly what I wanted to run it on. I was really hoping to, you know, get it running on that really old ThinkPad, the Pentium 2, but just can't get there. Believe it or not, Windows 8, Windows 10 have higher requirements from hardware than I guess a lot of us thought. But strangely enough, the CPU in this thing is able to cut it, even though the rest of the hardware kind of can't. But anyway, I'm glad I was able to give you some kind of results with this one. I was genuinely surprised when I got this thing to work. I tried it just for the hell of it, because why not? I had put so much time into this project as it is. What's, you know, another couple hours to 
screw around with it, getting this thing to work. But hey, there you go. So, you know, hopefully you learned something. Hopefully you were entertained by this one. I certainly was at times and incredibly frustrated at other times. But in any event, if you like this one, I would appreciate a thumbs up. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at thisdoesnotcomp. And as always, thanks for watching.